Hello again, everybody. Thanks for coming back. Uh, my name is Steve Nutter, and today I'm going to talk to you more in depth about the history of the CRT, or cathode ray tube display. And uh, just note that we'll be going through a lot of information here. Um, I will have some picture slides. I'll, I'll be reading some notes to go with each one of them. And uh, if you do need any uh, copy of resources for this presentation, I do have some available. All right, so the development of the cathode ray tube all started with a glass vacuum tube. And this is an example of what one of those first glass vacuum tubes would have looked like. So this all starts with these two gentlemen. And cathode rays were discovered in the mid 1850s and 1860s by Julius Plucher and Johann Wilhelm Hittroff. They used glass vacuum tubes to study cathode rays. And the first gentleman, Mr. Plucher, he was a German mathematician and a physicist. He made fundamental contributions to the field of analytical geometry and was a pioneer in investigation of cathode rays that led eventually to the discovery of the electron. He was made professor of physics at the University of Bonn in Germany in 1836. In 1858, after a year of working with vacuum tubes, he published his first researches on the action of the magnet, the magnet on this electric discharge in rarefied gases. Uh, he found that the discharge caused a fluorescent glow to form on the glass walls of the vacuum tube, and that glow could be made to shift by applying an electromagnetic uh, or electromagnet to the tube, thus creating a magnetic field. It was later shown that the glow was produced by cathode rays. So I know there's a lot of information here, uh, but it is kind of important to get through this. Now, the person that really helped Mr. Plucher was this gentleman, Heinrich Geisler. He was a skilled glass blower and physicist. Geisler descended from a long line of skilled craftsmen in Bohemia. He worked at the University of Bonn in Germany starting in 1852, and there he was asked by Julius Plucher to design an apparatus for evacuating a glass tube. And in 1857, he invented the Geisler tube, which is the original uh, cathode ray tube right there. This is the Geisler tube. Um, that's an example of what one would have looked like. Now this one did, uh, well it consists of a sealed partially evacuated cylinder with a metal electrode at each end which you'll see um, on the right and left of that picture. It contained a rarefied gas such as neon, argon, or air, mercury vapor, or other conductive fluids. Uh, when a high voltage, when high voltage is applied between these two electrodes, an electrical current flows through the tube. The current disassociates electrons from the gas molecules and creates ions. And when the electrons recombine with the ions, the gas will emit a light of fluorescence. And depending on what elements you used, you could manipulate this and make different colors and uh, things like that. So. Uh, eventually, Geisler's tube became more of a novelty down the road, and it, it, it kind of helped the development of neon, ga uh, neon glass, I'm sorry, and neon lights. But most of uh, the modern Geisler tubes now are simply for uh, uh, decorative purposes. Now, another, the other scientist I'd mentioned, Mr. Hitroff, um, he was a German physicist also who studied electricity, ions, and the atom. Uh, in 1853, Hittorf pointed out that some ions traveled more rapidly than others. In 1869, he asserted that the cathode rays glowed different colors because of the different gases and pressures. He noticed that there was, when there was any object placed between the cathode and the illuminating side of the tube, then a shadow appeared uh, at the other end. So these guys are really just the pioneers behind any of this study, starting with these glass tubes. Um, some other people and scientists involved in these studies, another one is 
Arthur Schuster. He was a German physicist known for his work in electrochemistry, X-ray radiography, and harmonic analysis and physics. In 1884, following his own cathode ray experiments, Schuster claimed that cathode rays are particulate in nature and that the particles all carry the same quantity of electricity. He also performed experiments on the magnetic deflection of those rays, which by 1890 allowed him to compare upper and lower bounds of, for the ratio of charge to mass of particular comp uh, comprising the rays. Schuster claimed that the particular or the particles were negatively charged gas molecules. So they're kind of going through a, po a point here of just studying these rays, trying to figure out what's going on with them. And uh, finally, we come to Sir William Crookes. And he was another, this is a British chemist and physicist. He created, uh, he's credited with discovering the element thallium. He also invented 100% ultraviolet blocking sunglasses lens. And he was a pioneer in vacuum tubes. So he took the Geissler tube and modified it and made his own version of the tube in 1875 that he called the Crookes tube. And so we've got some pictures here of the Crookes tube and the Crookes tube experiments. He used his Crookes tube to study cathode rays in his investigations of, conducti of conduction of electricity in low pressure gases. He discovered that as the pressure was lowered, the negative electrode appeared to emit rays. And again, so they're now they're talking about cathode rays. And Crookes discovered that the rays can be moved and manipulated by means of magnetism. So we've got now the ray going through the tube. And if, as you can see uh, in our demonstration picture, um, you've got where it's lit up and it's showing the gases and it emits a shadow on the back of the tube. And then if you look at the two bottom pictures, there's a giant magnet that's manipulating the rays and the shadow and moving it around within this tube. Here's just a more uh, simple drawn out version of that, but you can see where he's got an anode and a cathode at one end of the tube. And then they'd watch the ray, they'd add the magnet, and they watch the ray move. And so they were starting to study that the magnetism would affect these rays and could make it so you could manipulate them. Now, J.J. Thompson was also another uh, person, another scientist involved in the, the studies of cathode rays. He was a British physicist and Nobel laureate in physics. He is credited with discovering the electron, the first subatomic particle to be discovered. He studied cathode rays, and in 1897, Thompson showed that cathode rays were comprised of previously un unknown negatively charged particles that we now call electrons. He calculated uh, that the, they must have bodies much smaller than the atom, and in 1906, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. So this study at this time, it was less about display technology and trying to figure out uh, the comp, you know, studying the atom and just electrical waves. And J.J. Thompson, again, is credited with the uh, discovery of the electron. Now, finally, up to this point, we get somebody who has the idea to use this tube as a display. And uh, that is a scientist, Carl Braun. And so in 1897, he came up with that first display you just saw there. He was a German electrical engineer, inventor, physicist, and also a Nobel laureate in physics. Bra uh, Braun contributed significantly to the development of radio and television technology. In 1897, he built the first cathode ray tube and uh, also a CRT oscilloscope. And again, he's the first one to think of it as a display. The first tube was called the Braun tube, or the Braun tube. The CRT was a modification of the Crookes tube and had a fluorescent screen within the tube. Braun was again the first to conceive it as a display. If you look at this picture, you can see the fluorescent uh, disc that is at the bulb end on the left hand side. That's the display screen that would have been within the first tube right there. All right, so we start to move into after Carl Braun, and then we're getting into uh, more of a development of this technology as thinking of it for display and dis uh, oscilloscope purposes. And the introduction of hot cathodes allowed for lower acceleration of anode voltages and higher electron beam currents. 
since the anode now only accelerated the electrons emitted by the hot cathode and no longer had to have high voltages to induce electron emission from the cold cathode. So prior to this, CRTs did not have what was called a heater installed in the electron gun cathode area. That's what they started to add at this point and some plates to try to deflect uh, with magnetic plates. All right, so now we're gonna move on to a different uh, kind of era and uh, we're gonna stock, start talking about Kenjiro Takayanagi and his work in the display. He was a Japanese engineer and a pioneer in the development of television. He began researching television in 1925 after reading about it in a French magazine. Over the next year, he developed a cathode ray tube all electronic television set. On December 25th, 1926, he successfully demonstrated his system at Hamayatsu Industrial High School, where he was a teacher at the time. The CRT set had a 40 line resolution and it displayed this image at the bottom. The top is a picture of that original tube display. And then here is a closer look at that display. And uh, on December 26, he successfully demonstrated his system again at his, uh, his high school and that's what it would have looked like. I do have one more picture. So this was not something where he had an image to project um, like a video image, obviously. None of that had really been made. So he had a way of brightening up the image to the right and then getting that image to go through and be displayed on his screen. And that, would, that is what the image reproduction would have looked like. And he is known in uh, Japan as the father of television. And he continued to develop his TV sets. And by 1927, he had improved the resolution of the image up to 100 lines. And then one year later, he displayed the first human face on a CRT screen. Take Yanagi continued to play a key role in the development of television at NHK, which was the Japanese broadcasting company, and then at JVC, or the Jap Japan Victor Company, uh, where he eventually became vice president. He was also involved in the development of color television and videotape recorders for Japan. All right, so that's more of the 1920s era. We're gonna get into what other companies started to do um, as this technology progresses. There were uh, a lot of other TV sets actually in development during this time. We're gonna first take a look at an important, uh, two companies that were important for development of TVs, and that's RCA and Westinghouse Electric. Okay, so this would have been an example of one of their original uh, monitor unit test units, they called this one. The monitor unit, which, which came to be known as the octagon set, uh, was developed in the later years of the 1920s. It displayed a red and black image by means of rotating a rotating spiral hole disc set in front of a neon lamp. The motor speed was synchronized to that of the transmitter disc while the neon lamp flashed in accordance with the light impulses picking up by the photocells. A lens increased the 24 line, 20 frame per second image size to three inches square. So it was a three by three image. The electronics were built into a late 20s floor model radio cabinet. So you have the electronics built down in here and the octagon uh, TV tuning set up there. And again, this is like a test set. So uh, at this time, RCA in 1929, in the summer, the engineers had constructed a 60 line, 20 frame per second mechanical scanning camera, and they were transmitting pictures, including the images of Felix the Cat using RCA's FCC authorized call, W2XBS. And this is what that image would have looked like if you were looking at it through that early television set and on the octagon set. Now another group um, was making a TV set called the Camden Group, and this would have been a small uh, business that was working on a different style prototype for RCA to review. Uh, theirs was called just a mechanical TV. It was um, finally finished up at about 1930, and it worked similarly 
to the octagon set we just saw. So you've got those two sets in development, um, other early television development. RCA's president at the time, David Sarnoff, wanted to produce a working television system with the help of his former countryman, uh, Vladimir Kosma Zworkin. And Sarnoff had taken an interest in Zworkin's work at Westinghouse. So Zworkin was working at Westinghouse, studying early television, and uh, the problem was Westinghouse Electric was not really interested in funding or pursuing uh, really the work of Zwar Zworkin and further studies of the set. But in 1929, R.C. Sarnoff, in an arrangement with Westinghouse, he began funding the development of the iconoscope um, and a receiving tube called the kinescope. Both were developed and invented by Zworkin. In 1929, this would have been the kinescope, the kinescope tube, CRT. Uh, this tube, it was seven inches by 20 inches with a uh, willemite phosphor screen prepared by Zworkin's group, external vertical deflection plates as well as horizontal deflection coils were employed for scanning, and the second anode voltage was 3,000 volts. So these would have been um, quite experimental at the time and also had a lot of uh, a lot of electricity in them Here is the first kinescope TV set. Uh, this was demonstrated in a lab in May of 1929 and radio transmissions using separate channels for video and sync was added in August of 1929 and uh, There were seven of these test sets manufactured at that time all right, so there's, uh, this all comes together, these, these sets, they come together under what's called Sarnoff's tests. And uh, during 1930, Sarnoff uh, wanted to test the sets. Sarnoff and the RCA team began testing different TV sets against one another. Retired RG RCA engineer John Paul Smith was quoted, we gave a demonstration for General Sarnoff of the status of television receivers at that time. A demonstration was arranged was Zworkin's warehouse lab set, a mirror and lid set, which we saw that was one of the seven that was made. And then it had the octagon set and uh, the other set that was the mechanical set that we had talked about a second ago. These are those sets. So you see the, on the right-hand side, this is a photo from the original tests. You've got the octagon set and then the Camden Group's mechanical set. And then these two on the left were Zworkin's sets. Um, so. The, these are huge. The, all, all the electronics are actually in these cabinets at the bottom. So you have the one that has the mirror tilted up, and then Zworkin made one that was just a set without the mirror. Okay, so we get a little bit further down the way, and um, uh, it's obvious that RCA chose the mirror up set for the next set to develop, and this was a 1932 set test set. They did get the image quality up to 120 lines, 20 frames, uh, 24 frames per second. Picture and sound were tuned separately, and the, CR the CRT had a green phosphor. In 1984, RC or in 1984, RCA engineer Jeff Lindaro discovered an example of this television in an RCA warehouse in Indianapolis. It was being junked, and he rescued it. Uh, the video receiver is an 11 tube tuning from 35 to 55 megahertz. The audio, re audio receiver is a 10 tube super tuning between 55 and 75 megahertz. And the power supplied to the unit was 1,000 and 6,000 volts. So tons of electricity um, in this unit. And the way that they created the images for the display set in 1932, the, um, the 120 line images transmitted to the 19, uh, 1932 test set were produced by giant photocell reflector assemblies and they required to pick up as much light as possible from the subject illuminated by the scanning beam. The intense light was generated by a 150 amp arc, pro arc projector and chopped by the 120 hole scanning disc. The resulting image was still very noisy uh, according to the engineers so that 
This is a picture of that setup. You can tell there was just an intense amount of light that needed to be reproduced to get the image to show up. Here's just some photos of this 1932 trial set. Uh, you could tell in that middle picture how it's just loaded with the uh, tubes inside there that would power and help you transmit the image or the, uh, the frequencies to get an image. Now, and by 1933, Swarkin developed a spherical iconoscope that could be incorporated into a camera. A top-mounted mirror reflected the image uh, on, the mosaic, on the mosaic to the camera operator. So this is kind of the first display that would be on a camera so that the camera operator could watch what was being filmed uh, through a tube. And it's, it's very big and complicated, but there's just a tube in there. And it, it's a little bit distorted, but up by the sea, you can see that dome-shaped tube uh, kind of in that black and white image. Here's a closer look at this tube, and there's an explanation of the iconoscope operation. Uh, I'll read this to you. It's, a, it's an image focused on the photosensitive mosaic. Globules, globules liberates electrons, leaving them positively charged. In the bright areas, the electron gun produces a scanning beam that additionally charges the globules, and the different charge is captively coupled to the signal plate generating a video, video signal. So, I mean, that's a lot of speak. It's very complicated the way it's worded, but it's just um, basically the way he was able to get that image uh, reflected through using a lens through the back of the tube onto a plate. Okay, so this is all leading up to the 1930s um, when behind Sarnoff's leadership, RCA continues to develop a TV system with broadcasting capabilities. He announces at a stockholder meeting in May of 1935 that RCA would be investing $1 million into the project. The project would include the construction of studio facilities as well as a new transmitter and an antenna atop the Empire State Building in the mid-1936. In mid-1936, testing began in New York City's Radio City Studio 3H. Okay, so now we're moving on to a 1936 television by RCA. This is the RR359 receiver, originally with a 9-inch screen, was designed for use in the 1936-343 line tests. So 343, they're trying to up the resolution of the picture, make it more clear. This 32-tube set plus CRT tube used older 6D6s, some octal types, as well as experimental tubes. Separate video and audio IF amplifier strips were employed. The picture was still green and black and still reflected by a mirror for the viewers. Here's a look at that RR359, and you can just see how, um, how many tubes were inside that. It wasn't just the cathode tube. It was all those other little tubes for the energy transmission, and then to the left of that, we have a picture of that first uh, image. Okay, so now we're all the way up to 1939, and we're getting into something that is gonna be a little bit more available to the public. This is the top of the line TRK-12. It had a 12-inch combination, it was a 12-inch combination television and radio, and it was first offered to the public at the fair. The 1939 RCA publicity photo depicts the mirror in the lid 12-inch, $600 combination TV and radio in an upscale home setting. It tuned channels 1 through 5, 44 to 90 megahertz. Finally, the picture was black and white and no longer green or red. MSRP in 1940 would have been $600. And if we price that out to inflation for today, we're looking at a price tag of $12,321 for just that set. Now there was another set that they also came out with. This was the TT5. The tabletop model TT5 was offered for only $200, but it required a separate radio connection to provide the sound amplifier and the speaker. Thus, the set was often pictured with a, con a console radio nearby. It had a five inch black and white display screen. And again, it was $200 in 1940. Inflation, that would put it at about $4,100 today. All right, so elsewhere, commercially made cathode ray tube sets 
were produced uh, by Telefunken in Germany in 1934 and were sold throughout Europe. Here's some examples of these early Telefunken sets. They went with a little bit different design. Their tubes did wind up being a little bit bigger and they did not incorporate the mirror. However, the electronics did require a huge wood cabinet to house all the uh, uh, internal parts. All right, so now we've breezed through kind of the beginning era of television and we're moving into uh, the late 30s and 40s and into the early 50s. And black and white CRT TVs became very popular over those decades. And of course, since RCA was the first to develop these, they held a big market share at the time, nearly 50%. Um, and between 46 and 50, RCA Labs develop a color TV set using a shadow mask technology. And between 56 and 58, television was finally broadcast in color. And after the, that happened, into the early 60s, color TV sets really started to take off. And this is an example of what those early colored television sets would have looked like in the uh, late 50s, early 1960s. Here's a closer look at some of them. You'll notice you've got way more of a uh, rounded look on the picture as far as like a straight edge geometry which we have ultra, ultra, ultimately evolved to. But that's just an example of three of those sets. Here's some 60s sets where you're getting a little bit bigger pictures, more streamlined into cabinets that were um, a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. And RCA just continues to dominate the market at this time. So here's a little bit more on shadow mask CRT technology. So anybody who was in the class yesterday, we saw the shadow mask CRT, which would have been the Dotronics DNR27, or 25, I'm sorry. This uses three electron beam guns for each color, red, blue, and green. Uh, the color beams are shot onto a metal plate with tiny holes in it called a shadow mask. The original color beams were aligned in a triangular pattern called a triad, and the alignment was later changed to have all three colors side by side to improve brightness and picture quality. And this is just a small uh, illustration that demonstrates the electron gun with its triad figure shooting uh, the color beams through the mask that does have an electrode that uh, puts a current to it, and then that tells it where to land on the screen, and so the colors land on the screen and show you your image. These are pictures of a CRT electron gun that are in a shadow mask. So we saw the tube yesterday with that gun inside the mask, and then we saw the Trinitron tube, and if you compare it up here, you can see in this first image to the left and the top, uh, that second image over, you look down the middle and you see how those are separated out, three different color guns right there. And it's a bigger, wider gun. Um, and it's, uh, it was very tricky to get those beams aligned right at the time. Now, most of the time, you can also tell a shadow mask simply by the way uh, it was curved on the, on the glass. It's curved on both the top axis and the bottom and the left and right axis. So it's, it's got a curve on every edge, top to bottom and left to right. Okay, so where's Sony at this time? Well, in the 1960s, Sony developed a portable black and white television called the TV8-301. It was the first non-projection all transistor television. So Sony tried to get in with a, a later version of a portable black and white TV. There's that TV. Here's a closer look at an exact example of that television. And it had an eight inch display screen. It was discontinued two years later in 1962 because it was not selling well and the unit was prone to break down. So it wasn't a great start for Sony. In 1961, Sony executives, at, uh, they, they tried to develop a color television. They, they went to an IEE trade show in New York, and they stumbled across a booth for a small company called Autometric. Autometric had designed a, com a chromatron color CRT that uses a single electron gun. The beam is shot onto a vertical grill of electrically charged wires instead of a shadow mask. So Sony saw this technology, they bought it immediately, and they went in afterwards and started developing their own version of this chromatron TV set 
with Paramount Pictures' help. In late 64, Sony unveils the first co Chromatron color TV set, and it begins production. And at this time, to be competitive uh, in the marketplace, Sony's Chromatron TVs were sold at a pretty large loss in hopes that costs could eventually be reduced in future pr uh, production improvements. So they were selling them at a pretty big loss. Here's uh, pictures of that very first color Chromatron set. Um, this was, again, from 1964. By 1966, Sony had not been able to reduce the cost for production. Uh, more competitors started to make shadow mask color TV sets under RCA's license, notably Toshiba and Panasonic. And due to the continued financial losses, Sony is forced to redesign their CRD, or CRT and abandon the color TV market by the end of 66. Sony executives work with over 30 staffed engineers to develop alternatives to the chromatron tube. Between 1966 and 67, Sony engineers have a major uh, advancement in their design. They develop a new CRT electron gun, which emitted, again, a single beam separated by three cathodes and used a newly designed grill, of the a grill for the electrically slotted grill, now termed the aperture grill. So this is Sony's breakthrough in 1968. Sony had, designed, had redesigned all aspects of the chromatron and abandoned the chromatron technology. The new final CRT tube design was finished, and the final product was unique enough to apply for its own patent. The new Sony tube is named the Trinitron. This name comes from the root word trinity for the union of the three electrons and three electron guns into a single electron gun. Tron is taken from the word, rude word electron. So that's where Trinitron came from. And that was a pic, sorry, that's a picture of that uh, first color Trinitron set right there. Now here's some pictures of a Trinitron tube, just to show you a little bit difference. We went through this in the class yesterday, but the Trinitron tubes have one flat side to begin with and that's up there on the le uh, top left. And then at the bottom right is uh, a curved side. So one side's curved, one side's flat. And then there's a picture of how the smaller neck was made with a smaller uh, single beam Trinitron electron gun. Sony's new technology outperforms the competition on every level. The new screens are brighter and they require less adjustment after production and they are eventually cheaper to produce than shadow mask CRTs. This helps Sony dominate the CRT market with the Trinitron for the next 40 years. Shadow mask technology is still used during this time in competition with Sony, but it wasn't until their patent expired, Sony's that is, in 1996, that competitors started to make their major advances in shadow mask technology uh, that would once again rival the Trinitron in quality. Here's some pictures of 1970s example style uh, Trinitron sets, RF mostly. And then here's just how that progressed into the 1980s. Um, and you have just a sleeker design, smaller sets, and uh, more channel tuning abilities, larger screens. And so finally then we move into like the 1990s Trinitrons. And this is an example of how this technology basically progressed and towards its end of life and we get the plastic era where they've moved from the heavy wood sets to things that were smaller, had a lot of size variations and a couple of color choices, white or black. Uh, but the Trinitron tubes from the 90s are some of the best ever made and that's some examples of what they would have looked like. And then finally into the 2000s, um, you get the more modern look CRTs that you might have seen. Uh, somewhere before, but this is we're getting into those flat screen technology. So we've moved from having any curve to the 2000s where we start adding uh, just flat screens and other resolution and inputs are added like component video. Um, S video was added more in the 90s, but the 2000s started adding higher uh, quality inputs. Okay, so the modern T, the, let's talk a little bit more about modern CRT displays. And a cathode ray tube is a vacuum tube containing one or more electron guns, the beams of which are manipulated to display a phosphor on the screen. 
the images may represent electrical waveforms for an oscilloscope or pictures for a TV set. Uh, there was also radio or radar targets, um, and then a CRT on a television set is commonly called a picture tube. So we have some modern uses here for the CRT. Uh, we obviously have art installations are still using them. Arcade cabinets have had our CRTs ever since they were first developed, and a lot of people are really passionate about keeping CRTs in them. So they're always going to have arcades with CRTs as long as the technology exists. Uh, retro video games and really all any, uh, analog video consoles or content, even VHS, DVD, laser discs, really anything like that uh, really does a good job playing back because it was designed in analog form and so it fits best, easiest with uh, an analog playback monitor. So you can use this also, modern uses are retro PC installations. Uh, you can use it to stream four by three aspect ratio content in the proper aspect ratio. Of course, there's still military equipment that uses CRTs and oscilloscopes are still used and used today with CRTs in them. And uh, let's talk a little bit more and how this CRT display actually works. I'm about to show you a really nice picture with a lot of stuff going on here. But this would be your shadow mask tube. Uh, you could start all the way on the right-hand side, and you see how we have our end with our electron gun in it, and then our pins outside of the tube. That's where our neck board would connect, and then our neck board would send the data and energy into that electron gun and emit the proper beam to shoot, and then the, the deflection coil and the deflection yoke, which is right beyond the, uh, the electron gun and the short end of over on the right, that thing in the middle with it says deflection yoke and coils, that's the device that creates the magnetic field and tells the beam where to land on the screen. And then it's also dialed in further on the screen and, and the colors are sent to the proper spot through the aperture grill, which again is energized. It realigns the beams and spits it onto the glass. And then it's just drawing that image at a high enough refresh rate from left to right and top to bottom that our eyes naturally cannot see this drawing happening, but if, we, if we, our eyes were working at a faster frame rate, we would be able to see it's just a line slowly being drawn from top to bottom, and then it starts over again at the top. Okay, so I, like we've been talking, CRTs are designed for analog video. Most consumer CRTs and pro video monitors display 240p and 480i video resolutions. There are some higher end pro video monitors that will display 240p up to 1080i in the digital video resolutions uh, because digital video resolutions start at 480p and above. Uh, they can be displayed on VGA CRT monitors or computer monitors. Nearly all flat screen TVs and uh, normal flat screen monitors don't support 240p or 480i video resolutions properly on their own. The, um, the analog video processing will add latency, artifacts, visual noise, et cetera. So when you try, that's like when we were talking about uh, trying to put some old analog video signal just into a normal uh, newer CR or newer HDMI television, you get a lot of, uh, sometimes those built-in TVs will add things to your analog video signal to try to get it properly sent onto the screen in a, um, in an HDMI fashion. And you can tell here this, this, these boxes on the left at the bottom represent what the size of the screen is as you go up in resolution. And that blacked out box area is the resolution uh, containment area for a normal CRT where you just have the four by three or you could have a widescreen CRT down there that might do the green. But really anything over that is all digital, the red and yellow. Now, there are a lot of disadvantages to CRT technology. They do have high power consumption. They're big and heavy. Um, they're relatively small maximum display size. That says 36 inches, but that's obviously wrong because you guys have two that are 44 inches, much bigger. Uh, we do, there is this uh, thing called 480i flicker, which has to do with the way that the video resolution 480i works. And we will get that into that more into the resolutions 
how video resolutions work presentation, but that's just a phenomenon where people watch 480i video on a display and you can almost see a flicker as the image is shown on the screen. There's a high frequency of noise associated with CRTs and that's from the flyback transformer and uh, some people don't hear it. It is a high-pitched come of squealing noise, but a lot of people do hear it. And it's supposedly as you age, you lose that frequency. So you, you know, you might, some of us might not be able to hear it. I, I still can't a little. Um, most can't display digital video signals we just talked about. And of course, CRTs need servicing and repairs at this point because of their age. And they've all kind of cycled out um, of their life expectancy. All right, so if you're looking for a CRT for some reason, there are some things you should really ask yourself um, when you're deciding to buy these. There are some markets, believe it or not, globally that still do refurbish and sell CRT sets. Um, a lot of markets in Asia and, uh, and like India and a lot of that area still do sell uh, CRTs as a normal display. And these are a lot of times refurbished, recycled units that get sent there from America and the Western world. But if you do find yourself looking for a CRT, you should ask yourself, does it work? How does the screen look? Um, sometimes the branding can be important uh, because the better the brand generally means the higher quality of the build. What inputs does it have? And what screen size fits your situation best? And if you want to, you should consider what year it was made if you're concerned about um, life expectancy or needing to service that tube. Something newer might be better. Okay, let's look at just some normal consumer CRT TV video inputs. We've got RF, which is just radio frequency, and that comes in the form of a coax usually. Uh, now, in the older TVs, you might have to screw something into the back where it has a UHF and VHF plate on there and it would just be screwed in by like a, a blank cable that would go to an antenna. But eventually that was put in that coax form which you can see on the top picture at the far left. Uh, then you have composite AV which is the yellow, uh, white and red plug-in down there. And then you have S-video which is a little bit higher quality video which separates chroma and luma from the signal in the video and that's the four pin DIN connector uh, it's at the bottom picture here. You can see it right there. That's an S-video input. And component video was added to those later sets. And some, uh, before it was officially called component video, it was also labeled color stream video by competitors. So if you run into a set from, our, um, from Toshiba, they will use color stream, they'll call that, but that's just component video. That's their version of it. So if you see color stream, that means it has a component input. Some of the best brands of the consumer CRT set, we'll look at just some really high-end ones for, uh, first off, of course, Sony Trinitrons we've gone through. Um, in yesterday's demo, we could see how much more hardware was in the Sony compared to the other brands, how much more, to, um, how much better the technology was basically advanced to. Sony really had the CRT technology um, done to a really good level by the time they finished in the, in the 90s, so they're always gonna be a top brand there. And again, two of the other uh, really, really, really good brands are going to be JVC and Toshiba. Toshiba came out with a top-of-the-line AF series. That's one of them, one of their best ever that they made. And then the JVC had a D-series CRT television that was just an incredible set. Um, it's one of their bests that they ever made. Now, what about the best CRTs that were ever made? Uh, they would have been man manufactured from the late 80s till the mid-2000s. Many companies in CRT industry produced commercial-grade CRT monitors. These professional video monitors were developed for three industries, the medical field, the film and TV production uh, industry, and security, CCTV. The pro monitors often cost 10 times the price of the consumer television and monitors, and pro-level monitors provide superior picture for, uh, performance, and they are completely adjustable and really were unrivaled for their quality at the time. And pro-CRT monitors also offer more inputs, and consumer grades do. They have uh, support for both PAL and NTSC videos often, and they have higher screen resolutions and better display picture. 
And um, so here's just some pictures. Again, we've been talking. We went through the PVM yesterday. Sony also made a BVM, which is a broadcast, and that would have been their highest quality monitor. Excuse me. And then here's just some more examples of PVMs. There's the 2030, but there were plenty of other versions and uh, footprints that they made. This is a 1354Q at the top left that would have been from the middle 1990s, pretty much right after the 2030 was made. Sony went over to this 54Q style, which would have had all the dials and things at the bottom and the pull rack mount um, hardware right there at the front. And then there's a larger version of what that progressed into, into the late 90s, early 2000s, the M2 MDU right under there. There was also a gray version, but that's specifically a medical version that had the white frame and build out. And then there's these field monitors that you would have seen a lot uh, during the uh, 90s and early 2000s, these eight inch field monitors. Here's some examples of what a BVM would look like. They have a lot more hardware, generally cost a lot more more uh, more dependable for the build quality. And this is what a 20-incher would look like with a built-in controller. You can get ones where that controller's not there. That controller can be moved elsewhere so you don't have any controls available uh, from the outside if you want. There's a BVM that's built all in one at the top, and then they also had field BVMs. And uh, the back of the BVM, they were a little bit more modular, so they would have options as to what inputs you could fill it with whatever input cards you need. Sony would provide that, and then they provide a bay in the back that would have four or five different slots, and you could insert, pull out different cards and switch up the capability of your monitor that way. Uh, Shadow Mass Pro C CRT monitors were also made. These are the major companies who made them. There's JVC, Panasonic, Ikigami, and NEC. And uh, that right there in the picture with Sonic is a JVC monitor. There's also Panasonic's version up here. Um, there's a picture of the JVC monitor we just saw, a TMH150CG. There's the Ikigami monitor right here, which were pretty much broadcast quality, the Ikigami ones, so they're all metal. And then the XM29 is a very large screen from NEC. Um, this one is highly desirable just because it's larger and it also does a little bit of digital processing. So NEC added 480p support to their monitors, which gives it that uh, just almost a little bit more of an edge if you need that, um, that's a good monitor for it. And let's talk a little bit about multi-format pro CRTs. And these are CRTs that support video signals from 240p or 480i, that analog video, all the way up to the 1080i format through component video and HDSDI. They generally had really high levels of uh, resolution built into the tube itself, so they maxed out at about a thousand lines on the top of models. They even had a widescreen format available. They were Sony's highest build qualities. Um, they do need regular maintenance, and they are complex. That was a pretty much a normal thing for these when they were in use at the time. And they do have to have an external controller and the video cards. This is an example down here of one that you'll notice has no controller uh, built into it. There's, there's an option port right here to add on the front a controller or the back, but you can control it um, remotely so you don't have to have just the knobs there. So here's some just examples of those multi-format CRTs. At the top is a 24-inch widescreen BVM this is just a, actually, that, that's just a mantra C, uh, CRT. It goes up to 32 inches and weighs a ton. And they also have the PVM 20 L5 series, or four, which, well, L5 series, sorry, that came in a 14 inch or a 20 inch variety. That's over here on the right hand side. Uh, that was not as high build of quality as the BVMs. It was just the best uh, supporting multi format. PVM that Sony came out with. So it's not as high a build quality, but it does do that same resolution support. And then there's an example on the bottom of the last generation that Sony made in a CRT format. It's the A series, made up until about 2007. Uh, BVM A32 was the largest that they made, a 32 inch widescreen version of the analog television and multi format. 
Uh, so shadow mass multi-format CRTs are also available. Ikigami has a couple they make. They make a 20-inch version, a 15-inch version right there. Uh, very nice, high build quality broadcast monitors, uh, kind of a comp competitor to Sony. Very good s screens that they made on those. There's also a JVC version of a digital video monitor that does that 1080i support. This is that DTV series. They got a 17 inch on the right and then a 19 inch version on the left. There's also a bunch of PC CRTs that are out there. There's some top ones. The Sony GDM FW900 is a widescreen CRT that people are just crazy about um, if, they look in, if they're looking for a CRT for uh, computer purposes. It has just an uh, unbelievable native resolution of 2304 by 1440 at 80 hertz and uh, really high vertical and horizontal refresh rate. Okay, so we're climbing down towards the end of this. Uh, the last thing I like to talk about a little bit is e-waste. Just uh, some interesting facts about e-waste. So in 2006, the EPA designated CRTs uh, that are marked for disposable, they're considered hazardous waste. And that's due to the lead in the funnel glass of the tube. And they don't, it, it, this has never changed. They encourage recycling and, or reuse. Um, basically, reuse is the only thing at this point that's still profitable. It's very difficult. It's possible, but it is very difficult and expensive to properly recycle this glass. Again, because of the high lead content in it, uh, the glass is hazardous when it breaks its vacuum seal. And there's only a few places around the entire world that have the ability to extract the clean glass and the lead from each other. It's a very high heat process of molten glass. They can extract it and sell it in its natural form. Um, but that's the only way to properly recycle it. You can't, for example, break up. Sometimes you have the options to break up glass and add it to concrete mix as a additive uh, to kind of get rid of it, but that's not possible because again of the lead content in these tubes. And of course you couldn't reuse that glass for anything else that would be used by a person. So just remember, um, if you do have a CRT and you want to dispose of it, the regulations will differ per state on how you're supposed to suppo uh, dispose of it, but there are companies that will take your tubes um, and you can ship them to them and they will break it down properly or get it into the right place. So yeah, this, the problem is, is it's nowadays, this is where you'll see a lot of CRTs. They're very uh, expensive, hazardous, and difficult to recycle, as I said. So I've been in plenty of facilities that would look like this on the left, where you don't know what you have. It's, they don't have the manpower to sit down and break everything down because these things, you know, you have to eventually break everything out to get rid of a tube television, and you have to separate the tube from all the other electronics that are recyclable, so it's very manual, time demanding to just rip it all apart. Uh, unfortunately, most CRTs do end up in landfills, or they get shipped overseas for the dangerous uh, metal scrapping trade. So these are just some different pictures from around the world. There are plenty of documentaries that will show you uh, terrible things happen where these end up in areas of Africa and um, other areas around the world in developing countries and you'll see children around smoldering pits of fire uh, actually breaking down circuit boards and removing components to sell uh, on the secondary market and it's very dangerous obviously it's there's the the components are covered in more lead we talked about solder they're burning the solder with fire, so there's open fumes where they're constantly breathing in uh, leaded solder, and this lead also gets into their ground and into their water table. And then what they usually do is just throw the tube out. It breaks on the ground. It just gets trampled up. So all of the lead from the glass in the tube is all over the place in some of these areas. But there is good news. There's still plenty of great CRTs available, and um, <laughs> everyone should own at least one, maybe more. <laughs> uh, but that's going to wrap up this presentation today. Uh, thank you. And I don't know if anybody had any questions. Tish.
Okay, yeah, that is called a tally light. And um, let's go back a second and look at one. So the tally light, for example, right there, you mean? That's, uh, that's a system that will light up. It's got a remote control port in the back. And what it was designed for, so you're in a uh, broadcast environment, let's say um, a room, and you're like, which camera's which? Which camera are we on? Like, and when you have 20 monitors in front of you and you're a production manager and you want to know which monitor you're on, you want to know which one you want to switch to, and the best way to do that is like, you'll energize this one, it'll turn green. You can change it yellow sometimes or red. So you could have it like, well, this one's next, that one. And it's really just a method of knowing which one is active. Yeah, yeah, you can actually trip it out if you just have a, um, if you have just a cable that has, you know, just a, a, a cable with a metal end on each that conducts electricity, small, tiny, you can go in the back and you just put the pin for uh, tally light, it's in the manual, it'll tell you which one it is, and you just connect that to ground, um, the ground pin, and it'll always light up when you turn it on. So it'll always be green, and you just unplug it, and it'll turn off. So that's the way you did it. You would have a control board, and you'd hit a button, and it would light that up to tell you what it was. Anything? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh my goodness. So the um, the price difference is really unreal. So if you look at this page, this 20L5 on the right, it, it sells for almost the price as it was new still today because it was about $4,000 when it came out. But the two BVMs, whew, I mean, you're looking at about $40,000 for those machines each. Then? then now... Now, if you have a good one of the 32, you could probably sell it for $12,000 on the open market. And then the 24 inch, that will go for uh, 10,000, 8,000, depending on the condition. It has to be in good shape. Unfortunately, I've got one more of these 24 inch ones, but the tube's bad in it. So it's kind of like a giant boat anchor because <laughs> it's very hard to find a replacement tube for some of these. And unfortunately, there is a replacement tube and another monitor for that uh, D24, but it's in, oh, did I go too far the other way? It's in this uh, CRT, uh, I showed a picture of it, the FW900, it must be there. This FW900, let's see, when people found out about this one, they go crazy about it. There's some guy who has like 10 million 10 million followers on YouTube that does a tech channel. And like last week, he highlighted this monitor. And every time that happens, everybody on the planet goes crazy trying to get one. And they're already impossible to find. So every time that happens, uh, they just become harder and harder to get. I have a 20-inch version of that monitor. And I found it so luckily a guy um, on Facebook Marketplace put it available for $100. And it was four hours from me. And I immediately told him I would buy it. And I was like, please, hold it for me. I know you're going to get about 1,000 people after me finding you. And sure enough, he did. And uh, I was really happy to get it because it has all the same resolution. It just has a 19-inch screen that's 4 by 3 instead of the 16 by 10 widescreen. People are so enamored with the widescreen because it's, it's comparable to a modern display. And they can hook up a modern PC to it and then, you know, play whatever games on there and do things like that through their PC. Any other questions? Nobody anymore. It's, the, la the, the thing is, is um, the, the actual art and hazardous nature of making a CRT. All those facilities were shut down and basically phased out once CRTs became uh, the dead technology because CRTs have just gone through more of a resurgence over the last eight years if you really want to track it back to when it started to hit and come forward. But before that, 
these would have been just scrapped and a lot of, like I showed you that last picture, even really good ones, companies wanted to get rid of them and didn't care. They just wanted to bring in all new flat screen technology. And so a lot of them ended up gone and at the same time the production companies that were making CRTs, the, they switch over to flat screens, abandon all their old tooling and all their old personnel that was um, glass artisans for the most part, knowing how to properly, I mean, if you think the complexity of making a glass tube that's consistent and working, that was, that took, that took Sony 60 years and near bankruptcy to, or not 60 years, but it took them a decade and near bankruptcy to get it perfect the first time. And then they got rid of all that technology. So now we're at an edge where you just, um, I don't know if there's enough skilled people that would be able to pull it off, but also the environmentally dangerous nature of the lead glass would, you would never get a jurisdiction most likely, at least in the modern world um, or Western world to give you a permit to make that kind of a glass tube. Well, it's a good point that we probably can't do that because of the glass. Yeah, so he, yeah, so um, when, let's say it's the years 2007 or eight, and there are some companies, so when you get to the end of the life span of the CRT, you had a lot of companies that would use, it's like one company would make the tube and that tube would be in maybe 10 different types of CRTs. It could be in an Orion branded CRT or a Zenith CRT that would say Zenith on the outside, but the tubes might be the same from one place that made just the tubes and then sold them to the different places to be fit into a television set and then sold on the open market. So in the Dotronics case, he was able to find someone who was ready to get, was basically at the end of their uh, production cycle. They had a lot of leftover si certain sizes of tubes, thousands of them, new old stock. And so he was able to uh, purchase those and store them and then develop his own method of getting the hardware, the circuit boards to work on that screen. And so that's how he's making new CRT like monitors, but the tube itself, which is an integral part of it, that's not being remade. Uh, there are some companies that make the flyback, which is a, the, the other high voltage system with the little plastic um, piece on the main deflection board. There are companies that will make those still to this day in Asia. Uh, so there's an ability for that, but there's nobody making the tubes at all anymore that I know of. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. That'll do it for this one. <laughs> Thank you.